Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks Hi, Abby, for, for inviting Heather, who is my PhD student, for presenting her work today. So I think Heather is going to talk about something quite shocking or surprising to us when we first found this phenomenon. It is that the classical method of principal component analysis, short as PCA, everybody learns from an undergrad stats class, actually outperforms some of the, I would say, specifically designed and fancier methods for inferring the hidden covariates from the EQTL, which is the part part of the genetic study nowadays studies. So how do we infer the hidden factors from a gene expression matrix? And Heather found that PC actually has much, I would say a lot of advantages over those newer methods. So that's why I think this message should be interesting to our users. And also related to this theme, my group recently had another publication which shows that if you have, if you perform the differential expression analysis to find the so-called differential expressed genes, and if your sample sizes are large enough from two conditions, we found that the classic Wilcoxon ring some test actually outperforms the popular tools like DE621 HR. So I think these are all very interesting findings and useful for the users. So yeah, so Heather, please go ahead. Thank you, Jessica, for the introduction, and thank you, PC Bio, for having me present here. Oh, I should share my screen. So, as Jessica was talking about, our finding in one sentence is that PCA outperforms popular hidden variable inference methods for QTL mapping. And I will give a brief introduction to the background of QTL analysis and then go over our main results. So QTL stands for quantitative trait loci analysis. And um, it interrogates the relationship between genetic variants and molecular traits as opposed to complex traits. And the original Motivation for this kind of analysis is to help explain associations found between GWAS variants and complex traits. And examples of QTL analysis include gene expression QTL or EQTL analysis, which is the most common. Also alternative splicing QTL, SQTL analysis. And a newer example is the three prime untranslated region alternative polyadenylation QTL analysis. So this image taken from a published work um, illustrates the basic idea of EQTL analysis. So um, the standard practice is to look at one gene's expression levels and one SNP at a time across a number of individuals. So on the X axis, we have the genotype of one, at one SNP for the different individuals. And the y-axis represents the gene expression levels measured in those individuals. So on the left-hand side, we can find, we can see um, visually that there is an association between how many minor alleles this individual has and how high the expression level of the gene is. So in this case, we tend to believe that there is an association between the gene expression level and the genotype at the SNP location. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, um, there doesn't appear to be this kind of association. So this is what we try to look for in an EQTL analysis. So one challenge in QTL analysis in general is that measurements of gene expression levels or other molecular phenotypes can be affected by a number of technical or biological variables. So if these variables are observed, then it's simple and we can just include them as covariates in our QT, QTL analysis. But what's difficult is that many of these variables may be unknown or unmeasured, which makes them hidden variables. So the standard practice now is to first infer the hidden variables from the phenotype data, for example, gene expression matrix, and then include the inferred variables as covariates in the QTL analysis. And this type of approach has been shown to both improve the power of QTL identification in simulation settings 
and empirically increase the number of discoveries in QTL studies. So this plot was taken from a recent GTAC consortium paper where they published results about EQTL and SQTL analyses. Um, the x-axis then the x-axis shows how many peer factors they include in their QTL pipeline. And the y-axis shows the number of e genes, or um, we can understand it as the number of discoveries they make from the data set. So if we look at one line, which corresponds to one tissue type, the number of discoveries increases quite, signif quite significantly as we include up to some number of peer factors as opposed to not include any peer factors. So peer factors are the most popular kind of inferred variables. In other words, peer is the most popular hidden variable inference method today. So um, as I was saying, peer is one of the popular hidden variable inference methods now. SVA, which stands for surrogate variable analysis, is one of the first popular hidden variable inference methods for large scale genomic analysis. Um, PEER stands for prob probabilistic estimation of expression residuals, and it's the most popular such method for QTL mapping by a lot. And the main perceived advantage of this method is that its performance does not deteriorate as the number of inferred covariates increases. So the, the perception is that um, this method sort of does not overfit. And um, another popular method is called hidden covariates with prior, with prior. These three methods were developed between I think 2008 and 2013 or so, and are still very popular now. Um, but from a statistical standpoint, principal component analysis, a very um, basic and fundamental method that most of us are familiar with, it, under, it underlies the methodology behind each of these three methods that I just mentioned. So um, our question was, which method is the best for inferring hidden variables in QTL analysis? And does peer, the most popular method, indeed have the perceived advantages? So our results, um, in summary, finds that we found that um, PCA is orders of magnitude faster, better performing under simulation settings, and much easier to interpret and use. Um, yeah, and um, so it, it is faster and better performing under simulation settings and also under real data sets, it's a lot faster. It's, it's much more interpretable. And in terms of the ease of choosing the number of in, inferred covariates and software usability, we found PCA was easier to use. And the right-hand side here, I summarize the inputs and outputs of the different methods. Um, I guess of note, peer outputs both inferred covariates and residuals of the expression values. So the user needs to choose which sets of output to use in their QTL analysis. But mainly the, each of these methods output inferred covariates which can be included as covariates in the QTL step. So um, we designed two sets of simulations to evaluate the performance of these various methods and the different ways of using them. In the first simulation design, which we call simulation design one, I followed um, the data simulation of Stiegel et al. 2010, which is the original peer publication, which showed that peer improves upon not accounting for hidden variables, among other things. Um, we found 
that um, in our research that this simulation design has some data simulation and analysis limitations. For example, the gene expression variation primarily comes from transregulatory effects, which is contrary to our understanding of biology where um, cis effects are more prominent than, than trans effects. So in our second simulation design, we followed the data simulation of Wang et al. 2020, which is the um, publication of SUSY, a, a fine mapping method. Um, we found that this simulation design was um, quite reasonable and especially it carefully controls the effects of genotypes and covariates. Oh, actually, um, their simulation does not include covariates. There are no covariates in their simulation, but we um, sort of extend that simulation method and also control the effects of the covariates in the simulations. So this plot summarizes our um, comparison of the different variants of the different methods under those two simulation settings. We find that um, on the left-hand side, which shows the runtime comparison, the, um, the peer methods are the slowest. So the yellow slash orange um, box plots are higher than the other box plots. Um, the first two um, positions are PCA methods, and they're, they're some of the fastest. Um, the last position corresponds to HCP. Um, it's also quite fast. And SVA is sort of in the middle. And then in terms of performance, um, accuracy of identifying QTL uh, relations, which we measure with the metric area under the precision recall curve, AUPRC, it shows that PCA is able to outperform all the other methods and brings the AUPRC quite close to ideal where we assume that the hidden variables are known. And for contrast, we show as unadjusted the AUPRC of not accounting for any hidden covariates. Um, another thing this plot shows is that here, the most popular hidden variable inference method does not have the perceived advantage that its performance does not deteriorate as the number of inferred covariates increases. So the the dark orange bars compared to the light or the light, the yellow bars are peer run with large K versus peer run with the true K. Um, in the more realistic simulation design, which is simulation design two, um, the orange bars are lower than the yellow bars. So that shows that the performance of peer um, is hurt by over. Um, by estimating too many peer factors. Um, so in addition, we found some other evidence that peer factors can be tricky to use. So one example was that we found in the three prime AQTL data prepared by Lee et al. 2021 from GTEC RNA seq reads that the peer factors can be highly correlated if the phenotype data is not transformed in specific ways. So um, these four heat maps show the peer factors. They're the correlation heat maps of peer factors calculated from the tissue type brain hippocampus. And um, the first one is when we don't transform the 3 prime A QTL phenotype data and directly run here using the number of peer factors chosen by the authors. Um, we found that in this case, the peer factors are all identical to each other, um, which we can tell from 
the correlation heat map. Um, if we center and scale the phenotype matrix first before running here, this issue is alleviated. Um, if we transform the data by inverse, applying inverse normal transform within each feature, this issue um, is somewhat alleviated, but still present very much so. And when we um, apply inverse normal transform within each sample, this is still a very serious issue. And um, inverse normal transform within feature and within sample are popular um, pre-transformation methods used in the field. I think um, in contrast, center and scale a more simple method, a simpler method is less popular. So um, I guess the moral of this story is that um, it's not guaranteed that um, peer factors will capture the various variance components of your data if not used very carefully and um, checking the data is essential. And I think I'm gonna skip talking about the bottom panel, but the bottom panel tries to summarize these correlation uh, feed maps into one point so that we can look across different tissue types more easily. Another striking um, piece of evidence that we found is that in the GTEC, EQTL, and SQTL data, peer factors are almost identical to PCs, but they take orders of magnitude longer to compute. So for example, in the uterus EQTL phenotype data, so this matrix is um, 129 samples by about 20,000 genes. So when we calculate the peer factors from that gene expression matrix, and separately calculate PCs from that gene expression matrix, we found that the peer factors and the PCs have um, pretty much perfect one-to-one -one correspondence. So this is the correlation heat map between the 15 peer factors and the top 15 PCs. So um, essentially there is no advantage to using peer factors and it's, um, more, it's less interpretable of a method and takes longer and more computational resources in general. So on the more intellectual front, um, PCA, SVA, PEER, and HCP are actually closely related statistical method. And specifically, PCA underlies the methodology behind the other methods. Or in other words, SVA peer and HCP can all be considered extensions or more complex versions of PCA. So we can start from the PCA box here. Um, traditionally, PCA is derived by maximizing um, the explained variance in the data uh, sequentially, or um, it can al also be um, derived by minimizing the reconstruction error. Um, <clears throat> so it's traditionally um, derived based on optimizing objective functions. But more recently, it has been shown that PCA can be derived as a limiting case of probabilistic principal component analysis, PPCA, which is a special case of factor analysis. Um, factor analysis is a popular um, factor dis discovery method often used in the social sciences, and it's based on a frequentist statistical model. So these are, um, these can be, these three methods can all be considered classic methods in the um, uh, statistical literature. And on the other hand, the new methods, PEER, SVA, and HCP can all be traced back to, their methodologies can all be traced back to PCA. So in particular, PEER can be considered a 
Bayesian version of factor analysis. Um, so the connection between PEER and PCA is established. SVA is not based on a model or objective function. Instead, it's purely algorithmic, or we can say data analytic. And the algorithm is heavily based on PCA. It essentially reweights the columns, the features of the phenotype matrix, and then performs PCA. HCP is um, defined by minimizing a loss function, and the loss function is closely related to the minimum reconstruction error loss function of PCA. So these methods are all connected in such a way. Last but not least, um, PCA provides insight into the choice of K or the choice of the number of hidden covariates. So <clears throat> in general, choosing K, um, which generally can be interpreted as the number of clusters or the number of groups is a difficult task, but PCA still provides convenient ways of choosing K based on the concept of the proportion of variance explained or PVE of the data. Um, examples of these methods include the ELBOW method or there is this algorithm called the BE algorithm developed by um, authors named uh, Buja and Yu Baglu in 1992. So in contrast, PEER and HCP do not provide convenient ways of choosing K. And empirically, um, practitioners often choose K for PEER and HCP by maximizing their number of discoveries. So they run the same pipeline with different numbers of PEER factors, for example, and then choose the number of PEER factors that maximizes their number of discoveries. So here we show via the GTAC EQTL data set that this way of choosing the number of peer factors may be inappropriate. Um, recall that in GTAC EQTL data, the peer factors are identical essentially to PCs. So um, in this script plot of PCs, PC indices versus PVE, we plot the number of PCs chosen by the elbow method and the BE algorithm. And we also plot the number of peer factors chosen by GTEC by maximizing the number of discoveries. So we find that um, the number of peer factors chosen by GTEC is significantly above the number of, um, sorry, the number of PCs chosen via the BE algorithm. And this is important because um, the BE algorithm intuitively um, keeps the PCs that explain more variation in the data than by random chance. So it should be um, considered an upper bound of the reasonable number of PCs to choose. So in this way, the number of peer factors chosen by GTEC is too large, and there is probably a problem of model overfit. <laughs> um, so panel B shows a contrast of how many PCs elbow and BE choose for the different tissue types in GTEC EQTL data, um, and also the number of peer factors chosen by GTEC by maximizing the discoveries. So this plot shows that for a lot of tissue types, especially to the right of this vertical line, um, the number of peer factors chosen by GTEC is significantly above the number of PCs recommended by elbow or B. Um, and in panel C, we try to show that um, we try to show that these numbers of peer factors are indeed too large because we can reduce 
the number of PCs by a large proportion um, and still obtain approximately the same number of discoveries. So those were our main results. In summary, through simulation studies and real data analysis, we show that PCA is order of orders of magnitude faster, better performing, and much easier to interpret and use. In addition, um, something that I haven't mentioned so far is that PCA has another conceptual advantage. So SVA peer and HCP are all hidden and variable inference methods, i.e. factory discovery methods. On the other hand, PCA can be used and interpreted as both a dimension reduction and a factory discovery method. So um, when we include PCs of the phenotype matrix as covariates in the QTL analysis, we don't have to interpret the PCs as inferred covariates. Instead, we can interpret, as, interpret them as the reduced dimensions of the um, phenotype or expression data. And this is, um, with this understanding, using PCs of the expression data is analogous to using genotype PCs as covariates, which is commonly done to correct for population stratification. In PT analysis. In other words, um, the PCs are no longer inferred variables. They are known variables. They capture the variation in the expression, their representation of the um, expression data. And this also solves the conundrum that inferred covariates such as peer factors are often difficult to interpret using known technical and biological variables. <laughs> and we implemented an R package PCA for QTL and provided a detailed tutorial available on this GitHub page where we um, provide um, automatic methods for choosing K for using PCA and a recommended um, procedure for using PCA in this context. So I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Jean Jessica Lee, and our, our collaborators, Dr. Yumei Li, Wei Li from UC, UC Irvine, and Dr. Lei Li uh, from Shenzhen Bay La Laboratory, also former and current members of our lab Junction of Statistics and Biology. I also received funding from these two NSA, NSF and NIH grants. And thank you, QC Bio, for this opportunity to present my research.